Here we're going to look at a couple of very elementary notions from set theory. So the first of which is the power set. So let's say we're given any set A, the power set of A, which we denote by this calligraphic P of A, is the set of all subsets of A. So we could write this in set builder notation like this. So P of A equals B such that B is a subset of A. So that's how we would read that. And here's a fact. So the number of elements in the power set of A is equal to 2 to the power of the number of elements in A. So this fact totally makes sense if A is a finite set, but actually there's some meaning to this as well if A has an infinite number of elements. But we're not really going to talk about that, nor are we going to prove this fact right now, because this video is part of a series to support an introductory proof writing class that I'm teaching, and we haven't examined the techniques of proof required to prove this in the class just yet. Okay, so here's my first example. We want to look at the set containing 0, 1, 2, or really, this is a... Uh, stand in for really the set containing three elements where you have any three elements. Now let's go ahead and look at the power set of this. So the power set, that would be the set of all subsets. So let's maybe write down this power set in a systematic way. We could start with the subsets containing zero elements. Well, there's only one subset containing zero elements because there's only one set containing zero elements, and that's the empty set. So notice that the empty set is going to be an element of the power set of A for any set A. So the empty set is always a subset of any set. Okay, so next we can write down the sets containing one element from A. So here we've got the singleton zero, the singleton one, and the singleton two. So singleton is a word for a set containing one element. So we've got three of those. Next, we can write down the set containing two elements from A, or I should say all sets containing two elements from A. So 0, 1, that would be one of them. 0, 2, that would be another one. And then 1, 2. Then finally, we could write down the set containing three elements from A, and there's only one of those. One, two, three. And now we can actually keep thinking. We could write down some subsets of A containing four elements, five elements, so on and so forth. But since A only has three elements, there will be no such subset. So we can end it. Now let's just count this up. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we definitely have the size of A equals three and the size of the power set of A equals 8, which is 2 to the 3. So that follows our fact over here. Okay, so let's maybe look at another example. So maybe we could say the power set of the real numbers. Well, this is extremely large. There's a lot of stuff in here. So, I mean, think about it. The real numbers themselves form a pretty large set. So we're looking at all subsets of real numbers. So notice that any singleton is going to be an element of the real numbers. So in some ways you can embed the real numbers into the subset of real numbers just via the singleton map. Then maybe like any open or closed interval is also a subset of real numbers. So that would be like negative three comma seven maybe including negative three, not including seven. So that's definitely gonna be a subset of R, which is the same thing as being an element of the power set of R. And then some other things are in the, there too, like Q, the rational numbers. So that's definitely gonna be a subset of R, so it's gonna be in the power set of R. And then Z also. So that's gonna be in the power set of R. Okay, so like I said, this is an extremely large set. So let's maybe look at one more example. And let's say that is the example where A is equal to the set containing the real numbers and the complex numbers. And we wanna be careful with this. This is not like the union of the real numbers with the complex numbers, but this is the set containing the set of the real numbers and the set of the complex numbers. 
So this is tricky, but in this case, the size of A is actually just two here. Okay, which means we can write down the power set of A pretty easily. It should have four elements because that's two to the two. So notice we've got the empty set. Well, the empty set's a subset of any set, so we're good there. Then we have the set containing the real numbers, the set containing the complex numbers, and then the set containing each of those. So there are four elements in the power set. Okay, so this is really all I wanna say about the power set for now. I'll clean up the board and we're gonna look at a couple more ideas from elementary set theory. So the next ideas that we wanna look at are those of the union, intersection, set, difference, and complement. So given sets A and B, we'll define their union like this. So we read this A union B, so that's gonna be all elements X, where X is in A or X is in B. So the union is like an or statement. So next we'll have the intersection. So that's gonna be written like this, A intersect B. So that'll be all X where X is in A and X is in B. The next we'll have the difference. So we'll write this as A minus B. And sometimes this minus sign has a little tilt to it, but sometimes it's just like straight horizontal. So keep a lookout for that depending on which textbook you're using. So this is gonna be equal to all X such that X is in A and X is not in B. Then finally, given some sort of universal set, the complement is either written with this bar over it or this kind of superscript of a C, we read that as A complement. So that's gonna be this universal set minus A. And usually the setting is pretty obvious when working with a universal set. Like perhaps we're looking at all real numbers and so the universal set would be real numbers and maybe we're looking at subsets like intervals or something like that. Okay, so let's look at some examples. So here we wanna suppose that A, B, C, and D are all distinct objects. They don't even have to be the same type of objects. Like for example, A could be the number four and B could be the set of all real numbers. And then maybe C could be, you know, all of your favorite colors of t-shirts. So they could be totally different types of objects, but they are all distinct. So here we wanna look at the union of A, B, so this doubleton, with A, C, D. So here we're just going to list all of the elements that are in both of these sets, or I should say in this set or this set. So here we've got A, B, C, D. We can see that because A, well that's in this first one, and it, it's also in the second one, but that doesn't really matter so much. Then we have B, that's in this first one, C and D are both in this second one. Okay, so next we wanna look at this intersection. So the intersection is like an and statement, so we wanna look for elements that are in the first set and the second set, but there's only one of those, and that is this element B. Same thing here, we wanna look for elements that are in the first set and the second set, but notice there are no common elements between this first set and this second set. So that means this intersection is the empty set, or we would say that these are non-intersecting or disjoint maybe. Next, we've got a set difference. So here we're taking a, B, C, set minus B, C, D. So that means we wanna list all of the elements in this first set that are not in this second set. So that's only gonna be a single element A because notice B and C are both in the second set. So here we get the singleton A. You might look at this and say, well, there's D in the set that I am subtracting, but that doesn't matter. Our first point of entry into this set is that we have to be in A. Okay, now we're gonna look at two sets of real numbers. So we've got the interval one nine and the interval four twelve. So let's maybe put this on a number line. So the important points are gonna be one, four, nine, 12. So we'll space those out like this. So one, nine, maybe I'll graph that above. That would be like that line segment where I've included both endpoints. Four, 12, maybe I'll put that here and here. That would be like that where I've also included both endpoints. So I wanna intersect those. So I wanna look where those two intervals overlap. So that's gonna be from 
four, two, nine, and I get to include both endpoints like this. So here I could say that this is gonna be equal to the closed interval from four to nine. All right, let's look at this last example. So we've got the closed interval zero to 20, and we're doing the set difference of that with the closed interval from five to 15. So let's see how we can do that. Well, the important points here are gonna be 0, 5, 15, and 20. So let's put all those on the number line, 0, 5, 15, and 20. Then we wanna look at 0 to 20. So that's gonna be everything from here to here. And then we wanna subtract everything between 5 and 15. So that means we want everything that's yellow but not purple. So let's see, everything that's yellow but not purple will give us the point zero and everything up to five but not including five because five is in the purple set. And then it'll give us 15 but not including 15 all the way up to 20 kind of for symmetric reasons. So now we can write that down as the interval zero to five union the interval 15 to 20 where I've included both of the extreme endpoints, but the in middle endpoints I have not included. Okay, so I'll get rid of this and then we'll look at an example involving universal sets. Now we're ready to finish this off by looking at some examples of complements. So in order to have the complement really make sense, we need a universal set. So here are two examples. The first one is fairly natural from like a calculus class where we would consider the universal set to be the set of all real numbers. Okay, so now in this case, maybe we would wanna look at things like what is the complement of the rational numbers? So maybe there's only one real way to write this down and this would be all x such that x is irrational because we've got a word for when something is not rational and that's irrational. But what if we did something like the complement of the set of integers? Well, we could actually write this down. We could write this down as a union of open intervals. So maybe it would be something like this. Zero to one, union, one to two, union, two to three, and then over on this side, zero minus one, and so on and so forth. So we've got this infinite union. We'll talk more about indexed unions and infinite unions later, but where we have taken out all of the integers. Okay, let's maybe look at one more. So let's maybe take the closed interval or maybe half closed interval one, three and take the complement of that. So we want everything outside of that closed interval. Well, here we can start to minus infinity all the way up to one, we will not include one. Now we have to skip everything between one and three we get to include three because here three is not included in the set which we are complementing. And then we go up to infinity. So that would be a complement of the set um, of real numbers between one and three, including th one, not including three. Now let's look at this last example. So let's say our universal set is the set of all numbers between one and 10. I should say natural numbers between one and 10. And we've got A, that's gonna be all the numbers between one and five, and B is two, three, four, nine, and 10. So let's maybe calculate some things here. So let's calculate A complement first. So that's gonna be everything in the universal set, which is not in A. So that'll be all of the numbers between six and 10. So six, seven, eight, nine, 10. So there's not much to that. Now let's maybe calculate some more interesting things. So let's calculate A union B and then take the complement and see what we get. So that is going to be, well, let's first calculate A union B. So here we'll have one, two, three, four, five, and then nine, 10, complement. So everything in A unioned with everything in B. So these numbers right here are either in A or B. But if we wanna complement this, we wanna look for everything in the universal set that is not in this set. So we're missing six, seven, and eight. So here, in the end, we have six, seven, and eight is the complement of A union B. Now let's look at this, A complement intersected with B complement. 
So notice that A complement, well, we calculated that up here. That's going to be 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Now we need to intersect that with B complement. So that'll be everything in the universal set, which is not in B. So let's see. We'll have 1, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Those are all of the things in the universal set that are not in B. Now we want to do an intersection. So we want to look for everything in this first set and in this second set. Well, 6, 7, and 8 are the only three numbers. So we've got it. That would be the complement of A intersected with the complement of B. Now, if you notice, this is equal to this. In other words, A union B complement is equal to the complement of A intersected with the complement of B. Now, the question is, is that an accident or is this something that is always true? And this is something that is always true and that'll be something that we prove when we move on to looking at proofs involving sets later. Okay, that's a good place to stop.